I'm just going to come right out and admit it. Sometimes I struggle with being around people who are very different from me, especially people who believe very differently from me. I imagine you wouldn't know anything about that. (laughs) People who are different are sometimes scary, and they can certainly make us feel uncomfortable. It's so much easier staying around people who think like us, eat like us, vote like us, believe like us. C.S. Lewis said, if you're seeking comfort, you won't find truth. We have a choice, comfort or truth. Surrounding ourselves with people who are just like us, it's nice, it feels good, it's important to do at different times in our lives, but it also can keep us stuck. Stuck in our prejudices, our biases, our hypocrisies, our ignorance. And so our blind spots don't get exposed because we hang around with a whole bunch of other people who have the same blind spots. We remain limited and our lives remain small. I'm reminded that it is the sand inside the oyster that irritates it, that makes it create a pearl. We need to seek out people who are different from us and learn how to be in relationship with them. And today I'm I'm really glad to be able to introduce you to somebody who's very different from me. He is an evangelical Christian minister of a megachurch out in Greeley, Colorado, my friend Bruce, who I'm looking forward to bringing up into the pulpit here in just a moment. But I want to tell you how we first met. It was a little over five years ago. It was right after my daughter, Sienna, died. And I received an email from Bruce. And it said, I'm an evangelical minister. And the reason I'm writing you is not to talk about theology or debate beliefs or to try to convert you or anything like that at all. He said, I'm a minister, I'm a father, and I was at your website, and I saw that you lost a daughter, and it broke my heart. I tried to imagine what it would be like to lose a child, being a father of two children myself. And he said, the reason I was at your website is that I bookmarked your website a while back when I was looking for some alternative perspectives. I wanted to know what's the other side of the theological spectrum saying and what kind of arguments are they making and I wanted to have to deal with those and wrestle with those too. So from time to time I go back to your web, I've come back to your website and I've read some of your sermons because he gave me a great compliment. He said because I feel like you do a good job of of articulating the, the liberal side of the theological spectrum and he said so that's why I came to your website. I saw the picture of your family and your daughter, heard the news, and I just wanted to reach out and tell you that I'm out here, I care about you, I've learned to care about you, you've told stories about yourself in your sermons, I've gotten to know you, Uh, I feel like I've gotten to know you a little bit. I never thought that I would even approach you, but my heart called out to, to just say, I'm here and I'm praying for you and I'm thinking of you. And so with that, I'd like to ask Bruce to take the pulpit and share this message with me this morning. Welcome. Thank you. Never thought I'd be here. good to be at All Souls, and I just want to say it's good to be out of Colorado. We got 13 inches of snow on the so <laughs> Love this Tulsa weather. But you know, my connection with Marlon really is a fascinating story, and uh, one that, that grew out of a sense of holy discontent in my own life on many levels. Uh, I felt I had become very insulated, and as Marlon said just a minute ago, surrounded by people 
who looked a lot like me, thought a lot like me, and mirrored a lot of my convictions in the area of theology and life. Um, I grew up as an independent Baptist. Uh, I attended Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina as a freshman in college. And things like that were encouraged. As a matter of fact, it was called holy separation, and it's what every good Christian was supposed to do. And so over the years while I left that school and increased the bandwidth of diversity in my life, really not a whole lot. And I began thinking, you know, it's like in a lot of social settings where you hang out with your friends and you don't necessarily go out of that social network to meet new people. That really had become me. And uh, I didn't feel stretched. I felt comfortable. And I realized that I had begun to interact with a lot of assumptions about people of diversity without a lot of firm conviction and a lot of conclusion. I had walls built around me. And I came to a point a few years back where I realized this is, this is not a good place to be. I became very uncomfortable. I became very discontent. And I realized I was missing out on something. And so back in 2006, I began praying that God would open the door to a relationship with someone who's very different than me. And at the same time that God would open my heart to embrace that person as a friend. I didn't have any idea what that would look like. I didn't have an agenda, I didn't have a plan, it was just something that was deeply on my heart and actually we began discussing as a staff, this is not a good place for us to be. And that's where Marlon said a moment ago, I, I stumbled onto the All Souls website, I really did, because I realized, where do I start? Where do I start? And I figured, well, let me start reading from different people, people who are leaders, people who are representative of kind of my place in life, but from a very different perspective. And that's, as Marlon said, I stumbled on and I had come back here several times, as well as some other websites, but there was something that just triggered in my soul when I, when I read about Sienna dying. And as a pastor and as a father, I thought, you know, how do you go on from such a tragedy like that? How do you fill the hole in your soul, not just for yourself, but how do you lead other people with integrity and wholeness? And so I just couldn't imagine anything other than shooting him a note and saying, I care. And I pray as one human being to another, one minister to another. And it was an amazing thing that he responded. I, I really didn't expect a response. I figured he got hundreds of cards and emails. And I know there's a lot of you here at All Souls. And I figured you surrounded him well. They did. I was a stranger. And so when I got a response in my inbox two weeks later, it blew my mind. And it was from that mind-blowing experience, just him engaging with me, uh, that the rest has become history, and I'm here today. Thanks, Bruce. So the question before us, how does an evangelical Christian minister and a Unitarian Universalist, or an evangelical Christian and a Unitarian Universalist, because we all, we all deal with this in different ways in our lives, the theological divide, how do we develop and maintain a relationship like the one that we have, which is filled with respect, a great deal of respect, and a great deal of affection for one another. And so that's what we want to talk about a little bit more today. And I will say that, that one of the ways that we've done that is to focus on what we have in common. And we've already mentioned that a number yeah. of times, being fathers, being ministers, being husbands, being men, all those kinds of things that, that make our lives, our hearts break open when our members of our congregation have a loss and we, and we sit with them and we pray with them and we hold services with them and when people in our congregations do things that, that damage their families or their lives and so we, we live with a lot of the same emo, in a lot of the same emotional terrain and so we've connected quite a bit on that and yeah. Bruce I'd like you to share a little bit about your experience. You know it's, it's interesting that apart from a casual acquaintance with Barbara Merritt who was minister at First Unitarian in Worcester, Massachusetts when I was serving uh, in Worcester back in the 90s I really never knew a Unitarian, um, and so I didn't know where to go with this. I probably, somewhere in the back of my head, I thought if I did know a Unitarian, I probably wouldn't like them, and, uh, and they wouldn't like me either <laughs> because of our differences in our beliefs and the labels that, unfortunately, within our respective circles, we've learned to attach to one another over the years. And uh, my, my relationship with Marlon really has changed this, and out of a sense of genuine curiosity. Um, it's been amazing to see, and I don't know why this, this surprised me, uh, but it amazed me to see on a very basic level the issues we wrestle with as ministers, as fathers, and spouses, and 
the scope of the ministries we lead and the issues we grapple with uh, really have a lot in common. Uh, we've enjoyed talking about our kids since his daughter died. I've lost both of my parents, and so we've processed this. Um, we've talked about our, our common yearnings to see change occur uh, within our specific arenas and, and circles, within our denominations. Um, and as a result of just the opportunity we have had to engage on a very human and very spiritual level, I've grown to have a deep respect for Marlon uh, as a man of integrity and with a genuine desire to represent God and his voice to today's world and to the culture of Tulsa and, and to you as a congregation. He loves you and he really wants to commit himself to you as a passionate pursuer of truth and representing spiritual relevancy to your life. I know that is very deeply on his heart. It's also been uh, fun to engage with Marlon out of a genuine curiosity about what makes evangelical Christians tick. I mean, we're, we're a pretty wacky bunch. <laughs> and uh, he's asked some really good questions. Even last night he asked if I was allowed to dance at the wedding reception. I said, oh yeah, that's that category of Baptist. I'm this category of evangelical preacher. <laughs> and uh, so we've had fun back and forth about that. It is true, and I'll just add to that that Knowing that, that Bruce and his wife were praying for me and Anitra when we were looking into adopting a child meant a lot to me. And, I, and when his son decided to join the military, knowing that our country is fighting two wars overseas, I, we talked about I knew what he was feeling, what he was going through, what that would be like to be a father and have your son mm -hmm. sign up for the military at a time like this. Mm -hmm. And so we've prayed for one another, and we've been in each other's lives, and that has transcended the differences that we might have in theology, which seem petty in light of what's real in life. Yeah. I actually have a very funny story to tell you uh, this morning about the first time Marlon and I met to fa face to face. Uh, Marlon and his family were coming to Breckenridge, Colorado in the summer of 07, and uh, we had said how cool it would be if, if we could get together halfway. Um, and so we met at a, at a sports brewery in the town of Golden. And uh, you know, <laughs> Neutral territory. And, and, and it was my recommendation, I, I might add. <laughs> well, well, you know, with sports brewery, and, you know, you've got television screens all around the place. And, and, and keep in mind, this was just a year after Marlon and I had connected, and we were still trying to find our way and what our relationship looked like amidst our theological differences. And, and so you could imagine how caught off guard we were when literally, and this is no lie, we walked into the sports brewery, and the Franklin Graham crusade was playing on every television <laughs> screen in the restaurant. I mean, I... I thought for sure Marlon would think I set him up. <laughs> uh, especially if he ever learned that I studied for two years at the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College when I was in graduate school. Uh, and it would be all over before we ever ordered our food. I, I really, I, I was saying this to Mar Marlon earlier in his office, I still have no idea how this occurred. Have you ever seen a religious crusade in a sports brewery? Not even in Tulsa. <laughs> in Tulsa. But honestly, and the truth really is this, Marlon, I, I respect you too much to manipulate you or to deceive you in what I can perceive to be a greater spiritual agenda. Uh, there is no bait and switch on my heart. I am not holding a trump card. And I didn't schedule that and I know, And I know that, and I believe that, and I've come to believe that, and that's the only reason why Bruce is in the pulpit this morning, because I wouldn't... <laughs> I wouldn't just bring any evangelical minister up into the All Souls pulpit. But I will say that uh, what surprised me more, Bruce, at that time than the Billy, that, that Billy Grant, or Franklin Graham was on the television was that you actually joined me in having a beer, which was, <laughs> stood out more and for me at the time. it was a good time. beer. It was. It was. <laughs> Bruce, tell us, I want, I'd love you to tell this congregation a little bit about what's on your heart this morning. Yeah. You know, as an evangelical pastor and follower of Christ, um, uh, Marlon and I both, by the way, have realized, I don't know if you realize how unusual this is, what we're doing here. Uh, both of us have searched our respective traditions, and I, neither of us can find a precedent to what we're doing here. And uh, so I just said, you know, there are some things coming in from my perspective that really are on my heart that I'd like to say to you this morning. 
The first is, as I really want to say to you, not all followers of Jesus Christ and evangelicals are cut out of the same spiritual cloth. And the Jesus that some of you here this morning are rejecting is the Jesus, a Jesus that I reject too. Uh, I realize that for some of you here this morning, there is a lot of emotional and spiritual freight attached to Jesus uh, because of the way he has been thrust upon you, because of the way that he has been falsely represented by some within my spiritual network. There are some who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, folks, that I don't trust either. And I need you to hear that. There's a lot of people doing a lot of stuff in Jesus' name that Jesus has nothing to do with these days. That's right. And I'm not a big fan of, of bumper stickers or pithy church sayings on signs. But there's a couple I saw recently that I really like. Uh, the first is currently on the sign of a Presbyterian church not far from my house. And it says, the fullest expression of what we believe is how we treat one another. That's a pretty good saying, and I couldn't agree more. And truth be told, as an evangelical follower of Jesus Christ, I'm appalled by the way some who share my theology feel the freedom to reject and treat those with whom they disagree. It is absolutely unacceptable from my perspective. In the book of 1 John in the New Testament of the Bible, the Apostle John writes these words. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever doesn't love doesn't know God, because God is love. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates, or in the original language, disregards a brother or sister, is a liar. Those are pretty bold words. Mm -hmm. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they've not seen. In the Bible, the love of God is unconditional. You don't have to wear a certain label or attain a certain religious status to be worthy of receiving it. And so to us and to me as, as a follower of Jesus, when Jesus said, love thy neighbor, he means all my neighbors. My homeless neighbor, my gay and lesbian neighbor, my atheist neighbor, my Muslim neighbor, my addicted neighbor, my Unitarian neighbor. <laughs> and the neighbor who is most unlike me, who provokes me, and who brings out the worst in me. I need to love him. No exceptions. In the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul talks about those who follow Jesus as being the fragrance, aroma, fragrant aroma of Christ. An aroma that transforms hearts and relationships and communities and people groups and the environment in practical life-giving ways, championing justice, compassion, and hope wherever it goes. Unfortunately, some in the name of Jesus who are well-meaning have turned his fragrant aroma into a stench. And it breaks my heart because it breaks the heart of God. Frankly, I think it's immoral. And I believe that in a court of law, Jesus would have just cause to sue for defamation of character. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. And the bottom line for me is this, to quote a bumper sticker I saw recently, I believe in the separation of church and hate. Yes. Amen. And so if you're here this morning and have been rejected or treated harshly, rudely, disrespectfully, or hatefully, by an evangelical Christian leader or church in the name of Jesus, I want to say this. I am deeply sorry, and I extend to you an apology. God had nothing to do with that. I believe God loves you deeply, unconditionally, just the way you are. Our church in Colorado is coming out of a year-long envisioning process with a brand new mission statement. Everyone experiencing the gospel. 
And the most provocative word in that envisioning statement, that mission statement rather, is the word everyone. But we really do believe the heart of God is for all people without condition or exception. That it isn't exclusive, that it's inclusive. Uh, at Christ Community, we want to be a church where our community would cry if we cease to exist because we've demonstrated to them the love of Jesus in practical, unconditional ways with no strings attached. And we're grateful, and, and I'm grateful, for the many doors God has opened to us in the lives of people and in our community and through a lot of things we have going on internationally. And really, it's blown us away. Jesus was pretty clear about his mission, quoting the prophet Isaiah in the Gospel of Luke. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind and to set the oppressed free. That's the Jesus of the Bible. That's the Jesus I follow. And I just want to say that my deepest longing and the longing of many within my church and within my network of evangelical colleagues, I don't know who you've met in Tulsa, but these are the folks that I hang around with who, who absolutely do share my theology, is to embody this same mission today with integrity, joining hands and entering into strategic partnerships with any and all who share this heartfelt vision. And I am grateful that my friendship with Marlon has stoked this fire within my soul. I'm grateful that he has empowered me to be a more authentic, compassionate follower of Jesus Christ and pastoral leader within the movement of the evangelical church. And, and I just want to say thank you, Marlon, for what you bring out to me as a brother and as a friend and as a fellow minister. You're welcome. And thank you, Bruce. And I have to say that this relationship on my side of the fence has been really provocative as well because I have realized that for so long I harbored a lot of prejudices. I could never imagine. I mean, mega church, evangelical Christian minister, it, it, I could not imagine somebody articulating the nature of Jesus' ministry and the Bible and Christianity in such a way. And I, I was guilty of labeling evangelical Christians based on the most obnoxious proselytizers, the televangelists who said one thing on television before millions and did something, were caught doing something else in their personal lives, and those who it felt to me like and still feel to me like use the Bible as a weapon against people I love like gay and lesbian people and agnostics and non-believers and others like that. So, but I've realized in my relationship with Bruce that I had been painting all Christians, particularly all evangelical Christians, with a broad brush based on my limited experience and my prejudices. And what I'm seeing through this relationship and as I open my eyes, how many great things evangelical Christians are doing in our world and in our community in terms of helping us stop AIDS, uh, you know, really fighting AIDS uh, in Africa and around the world, the, the work now more and more in, with the environment and all kinds of incredible ministries for, for orphans and, and others. And I realized that I had to recognize I had some ignorant things that, I was, that were coming out of my mouth mm. from, time, from time, even from the pulpit at different times early on in my ministry when I my, put my biases right out there. And quite frankly, I... I, I used to be able to get a standing ovation pretty easily by putting those. <laughs> because we don't, get, we don't have that many people articulating that frustration with that kind of Christian or mm -hmm. Christianity that's out there in the name of, of Jesus. So it's been very powerful for me, and I hope that for our congregation too, for each of us to think and search our own souls about the ways that we're out there spewing our own prejudices in ignorant ways and biases upon the community. It's not to say that we accept those, um, those aberrations of Christianity any more than you accept those, but to paint all Christians, or certainly all evangelical Christians, with that same broad brush is an embarrassment, and we do so at our own disgrace. And I also have been really moved as I realized that all souls wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jesus and the Christian church. It was Unitarianism and Universalism both were born of Christian Protestantism, and it was really the love of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus that formed Unitarianism, formed Universalism, and we're a product of that. If it weren't for Jesus, if it weren't for Christianity, we wouldn't be here. And so for members of our congregation to reflect 
negatively around Jesus and Christianity, it's really a, there's a perversion there that it's really important that we dis- make sure that we don't continue. So that's where I think our hypocrisy lies as a, as a con- potentially as a congregation. We always, it's easy to, to point at the speck in other people's eyes, but the, sometimes miss the plank in our own eyes and the, the hypocrisy that we are in danger of falling into in this tradition is the danger of being, trying to be inclusive of all and in our efforts to be inclusive, actually, in the name of inclusion, actually excluding a huge swaths of millions of, of Christians and believers that are out there. So I, I say to you, on behalf of the members on my side of the theological fence, I want to offer as well an apology, Bruce, for the ways in which we have derided and dismissed your tradition and people in your tradition who are doing incredible ministries and are incredible people mm-hmm. with great integrity who love God, love people, and are doing everything they can to live with values and, and authenticity in this world. And I see that in you, and I, I admire you for it. And, and that is, that's what's on my heart this well, morning. Thank you. Please. You know, why would we do this? I mean, uh, why would Marlon and I invest in a relationship across 800 or some miles? Uh, What does it matter? What do we have to gain from it? Well, there is a a proverb, Book of Proverbs 2717, actually, that says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Marlon has already said this a couple of different times, but we can learn from other people who are different than us. But especially when we dare to embrace them as friends and celebrate their presence in our life as a gift. Um, In the words of Proverbs, they sharpen us. It's very easy for me to affix a label or to stereotype and respond to those who differ out of knee-jerk ignorance. And in the process, offering shallow, superficial reasons for doing so. But something happens when we enter into a respectful, heartfelt relationship with someone who's different than us that keeps us honest. We let ourselves off the hook too easily. I need Marlon to keep me honest and to prevent me from making wide sweeping statements from my side that would include such things that are hurtful to others out of my own prejudice, out of my own pain, and out of my own past experience. And what's true for me, I know Marlon and I have talked about, has been true for him, and and I believe is true for many of you. It's really easy to default there. But we need one another. We really, really do. Amen. Well, love and truth and God, if you will, are often found where we least expect it. Right? And it's the story of the Good Samaritan. Samaritans back in the time of Jesus' day, were despised by the Jews. They were the lowest of the low, and yet Jesus tells the story of the priests, the Jewish priests walking by, but it's the Samaritan who saves the person lying on the side of the road, right? Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. A mustard seed? Everyone in that time talked about the kingdom of God being like the great cedars of Lebanon, the biggest trees like our redwood trees. And he said, no, 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 it's like a mustard seed. It's where we least expect it, right? The story of the prodigal son, it's not the good son. It's the wayward son that is the teacher. God, good, is often found in those whom we have despised or rejected or cast out. Here at All Souls, Our mission is based on the premise that there is a love beyond belief. And we are called to demonstrate and to be witnesses of such a love. Our ability to be in relationship with people whose faith is very different from our own is an example of a love beyond belief. Let us continue to imagine and let us continue to create a world in which everyone can recognize that beyond our beliefs and our differences is a love that unites us. The only God that I can believe in is a God who wants humanity to eventually realize that we are all truly brothers and sisters and that one day we can and will live in harmony. I believe that God is smiling upon us this morning For this brief moment 
we have glimpsed the kingdom of heaven on earth. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone.